Welcome back again. It's Tony Robbins. I'm very excited about this session because one of the biggest challenges for people is everybody wants a better quality of life. Everybody wants life to be greater, but almost all of us get stuck at times where something stops us, something prevents us from doing something that we really are capable of doing, whether it's turning around our body or shifting a relationship or turning around our finances or just maybe just being happy and fulfilled at a different level. We get stuck with a belief of how we're not supposed to be, what we're not supposed to do, what people won't accept, what we're not capable of. Or maybe we get stuck in an emotional pattern of just being pissed off or frustrated or worried or sad or overwhelmed. Sometimes we get stuck, you know, not so much in anything but some, just some habits of doing things a certain way. And what a breakthrough simply is, is that moment in time where there's an opening. And the opening can come from a conversation, it can come from meeting somebody that inspires you, it can come from an insight, it can come from watching a movie and being moved emotionally at just that right moment. It usually comes because something kind of clicked inside of us, something snapped us and made us look at life through a different filter, in a different way. And you know it's a real breakthrough because you take that little insight, that little distinction, that little moment, or maybe that little or big emotion inside of you that says, no more, I'm going to change this, and suddenly you do something to make your life better. You break out of the impossibility of life has to be this way or life is controlling me, and you start to take back control of your life. You start to make the shift that creates the quality of life that you really deserve. Everybody experiences extreme stress at some point in their life. I don't care who we are. Something happens outside our control and it hits our life and it knocks us on our tail. It might be a health stress. It could be something with your family. It could be economic, career. It could be something emotional that happens, biochemical. There's so many things. It could be an environmental situation that had nothing to do with you. Every one of us in our lifetime are experiencing extreme stress in these days because of the economy and the way we respond to it. The majority of people are experiencing some form of extreme stress, at least according to polls. Stress doesn't come from the facts. Stress comes from the meaning that we give of the facts. Yes, those things have happened. But the real question is, if we fight what's happened, we've got a problem. We've got to decide, what are we going to do with what's happened in our life? How are we going to take this? How are we going to mold this? How are we going to turn our life around? Because when you come up with a new meaning, you get a new life. So what are we going to do in this session? Well, in this session, we're going to take a look at something from a different perspective. We're going to ask you this question. What is the single force that controls the quality of your life? If there was one gift our Creator has given us, or the universe, whatever you believe, what is it, what is the one power that you have right now in this moment that can change everything? You have it, I have it, we all have it. It's this one singular individual power that can change anything in our life, regardless of what's happened to us. And I know you know the answer. The answer is the power of choice. The one thing we have in this world is we can't control the events, but we can choose what to focus on, we can choose what things mean, and we can choose what to do. Those three choices, those three decisions, really control our life. It's not so much the conditions of our life that control our destiny as much as the decisions of our life. Try for a second to think about something. Think about your life and just think about, are there a few decisions? If I were to ask you two decisions you've made in your life, you know, that if you would have made a different decision, you would have had a totally different life. I mean, it may be a life may have been better or may have been worse. I don't know, but you would have a different life. I'm not asking you to to buy into the fact that you should have known the answers. I just want you to see the power of a decision. How is your life better today because of a decision you made years ago? Not just negative ones. Think about it. Sometimes a little decision changes your whole life. Like you decide one day to go to a certain school and you go to that school or you, to go eat someplace and you bump into the person that becomes the love of your life. Or you meet someone and you decide as a result of that that you're going to become a photographer or a software engineer or a business person or a doctor, a dentist, whatever. They impacted you, but you made the decision, that's what I really want. That's what, that's what my life's going to be about. And that decision has affected so much of your life, what you do, how you live your life, how you spend your time, what you earn or don't earn, you know, who you attract into your life, beliefs you have, all come from some of these little decisions. What you decide to eat from your dinner plate each night certainly determines your physical destiny, right? We all know that, at least to a certain extent. I know there's a certain amount that's genetics, but I'm talking about the stuff you and I can control. So decisions equal destiny. It's not our conditions, it's our decisions. So if we want a new life, if we want a new experience, we've got to make new choices. 
if you don't like the way your career is or your business is, change it. If you don't like your body, change it. You don't like your relationship, change you first. Because if you change it, you'll bring you to the next one. Maybe it's time to change it too, but change yourself first. If you want to change anything in your life, you have the choice. So there is no right or wrong. I just want to make you aware in this breakthrough session that everything in our life changes the moment we make a decision. And I mean a real decision. A decision is when you cut off any other possibility and you commit to something with everything you've got and you take action. But the big decisions start with little decisions like what am I going to focus on? Because whatever you focus on, you're going to feel. If you focus on all the things that have been done to you in your life, of course you're going to feel like hell. If you focus on all the amazing coincidences that have happened, things that maybe they were guided, maybe not, but things happen, and because of that, you met this person that's your best friend, your husband, your wife, or because of that, you have this ability, or because you were there that day, God, you missed an accident. I don't know what it is, but whatever you focus on, you're going to feel. If you focus on people don't care, and you'll look for reasons why they don't care, and evidence they don't care, you'll find it everywhere. If you look for evidence that people are really good people inside, that at some level we all care about each other, you'll find it. Seek and you shall find. The secret is, have you become conscious about your decision making? Because this breakthrough session is, really, you want to change your life, make new choices. New life comes from new choices, but you've got to make conscious choices. The people in this particular television special, the, Melissa and her husband, they really found themselves in a place where they were both making decisions, Melissa and Rick, that were unconscious. When you make decisions about what to focus on and what things mean and what to do and you're unconscious, you get pretty terrible results usually. Now, we've all done this. I do it still. We all do. But if you want to change your results, you've got to become more conscious in your decision making. So think about it. What you focus on, you will feel, whether it's true or not. You focus on how people don't care, you're going to feel they don't care. Second decision you make is what do things mean. So you focus on something someone does and you come up with a meaning and the meaning is no one loves me. The meaning is they're trying to take advantage of me. Depending on what meaning you come up with, and you get to choose the meaning of anything. For some people, they say, this situation happened with the economy, and what that means is I'm going broke. Somebody else said, the situation happened with the economy, guess what? That means I'm going to work harder, I'm going to be more creative, it changed everything. Everybody else is going to quit, so we're going to dominate the marketplace. Are the people to do it. Is this the end right now, or is it the beginning? See, whether it's the end or the beginning is your choice. You get to decide. Because once you make up a meaning, it's true. If you think that this is the end of a relationship, are you going to treat people the same way as if you think it's the beginning of a relationship? No way. In fact, I tell people, if you want to have a great relationship, think about this. Treat people like you did in the beginning of the relationship, and there won't be an end. In the beginning of the relationship, when somebody says to you, would you take out the trash, what do you say? Of course, take out the trash. <laughs> You're happy to do anything, right? But after about six months or six years, you go take him out the trash. You go, what do you mean? What, I look like your janitor? Take out your own trash. The meaning we give things is very different, and so we feel different, and our life is different. In the beginning, you'll do anything for someone. Now you make up a new meaning. Why should I have to do that for them? Little choices, like what to believe about yourself, what to believe about other people, whether this is the end or the beginning, start to affect your whole life. And the third decision we make, we decide what to focus on, most of us unconsciously. We decide what things mean, and the third thing we decide is, what are we going to do? We decide to quit because it's overwhelming. We decide to get strong and focus. We decide we're going to turn it around. We decide to wait and see. Ultimately, your destiny is determined by what you do. So, for example, what do you do if somebody comes to you one day and says, you have a tumor? Again, I have that experience. I use that as a reference point because... I've had a lot of intense experiences in my life, but that was one of the more intense ones for sure. Had many, but that was very intense. You know, first, what do you focus on? Do you focus on it's over? Do you focus on why me? Do you give it a meaning that says, I'm going to die? What do you do? Do you just go through traditional therapeutic approach? Do you put yourself in the hands of someone else? Do you evaluate this? Do you get a second or third opinion? Your destiny is determined by your decisions. Now, if you're a guy like Lance Armstrong, you focus immediately on, I've got to find a solution. The meaning you come up with is, this is the ultimate battle. And what you decide to do is you're going to exhaust every possibility. Now, that doesn't guarantee you're going to succeed, but it's interesting. When you have that kind of a mindset, it shifts you. And Lance Armstrong, I mean, he was told things like, look, 
You got, a, you got tumors here in your brain, you got them in your lungs, right? You got, obviously, in testicles, and you ride a bike for a living. That's pretty tough. But he made it through all of those pieces. Now, am I saying because he made the right choices? I can't tell you that. There's certainly some grace in everything. I think in life, there's three things. There's our ability to choose what we're focused on, or to commit, to, to get a result, to put all our intention and focus into something. There's our ability to do the right things, to have the right strategy, to execute. And then there's some grace. There's what some people call luck, some people call grace. There's if you do the right things over and over again and with total focus, sometimes, you know, you get good fortune that comes your way. And you tend to have more good fortune when you're totally focused and decisive and you take lots of action than if you kind of just sit around and accept things like that like you don't have a future. But the point of the matter is this guy turned it around. What was he like after he got through this problem? After he had his breakthrough, after he faced cancer, racing against some other guy seemed like nothing by comparison. You're not much of a competitor. I faced death. And he goes on to win Tour de France after Tour de France after Tour de France, breaking every record anyone could ever imagine. What do you do Mac, decades ago, half a century ago almost now, and someone says to you, go to the back of the bus, and you're African-American? One woman just decided, you know what? You can't take my dignity from me. I can only give that up, and I don't choose to give it up. And I will not go back to the bus. The answer is no. And Rosa Parks changed an entire society. Because that day she chose to focus on something else. She gave it a different meaning. This is not a command. You do not have control over me. And she decided to fight. And she changed the direction of a country and of many other countries. She started something. We forget that you don't have to be famous to have the ability to change at least your own personal history to change the direction we go in our life. We have the power to choose, even if you haven't before. You can finally say, no more, I won't put up with that, within myself or from anybody else. And here's what I'm gonna do differently. That's where the breakthroughs really start to happen. Now the question is, why do some people stand their ground and make something change versus other people just kind of accept things? Why do some people make bold decisions and other people make decisions that are based on trying to hang on to what they've got? Well, that's a more complex question to answer than we might have in a few minutes in this one session, but it is one that I've spent my life studying, because when you can change your decisions, you can change your life. When you can change the force that controls your decisions, you can change anything in your life. At some level, we have certain beliefs and values, but if I was going to make it simple, I'd say there's two things that determine your choices. The first thing is the state of mind and emotion you're in at that moment. Think about it. Have you ever snapped at somebody and had nothing to do with them? It was just the state you're in, right? You're frustrated, you're pissed off about something, and in that state of mind, whatever they said got interpreted through that state, and you made up a meaning like they're an irritant or they're interrupting you, they weren't. You probably felt bad afterwards. When we get in the wrong state, we make the wrong decisions. When you get in a strong, empowering state, you'll make a better decision. Learning how to direct your state is a big part of what my work is with people. And it's a big part of what I do in my seminars. But the other thing that affects your decisions would be what I would call your story or your blueprint. We all have kind of a story about how our life is supposed to be. It comes from a set of life experiences, interpretations. Some people think life is all about getting theirs. Some people think life is about growing and contributing. Some people think life is about making judgments. Some people think life is about saving other people's lives. Some people think life is about being successful. Some people think God is the basis of everything and the way to know God is to go through life in a very specific way with a set of rules and they follow it. And that's what they believe. Whatever your story is, whatever your blueprint, your blueprint is just another way of saying whatever you believe is how your life is supposed to be, at some level, we either follow that blueprint or we fight it. If we follow it or we fight it, we're gonna find that we're gonna bump into things in life where life isn't always the same as we expect it to be or think it should be. And that's where we start to experience stress. So in this session of Breakthrough, when you watched this story and you saw Melissa, you saw the conflict between what she desired most and what she feared most. I really believe life is the dance between what you desire most and fear most. That's where you find where we live our life, the dance between what you want most and what you fear most. That's, that's where all that energy is in life. So what does she want? She wants to be famous. She wants to be able to sing and have everyone hear her voice and be able to touch everyone. She wants to contribute. She wants to share her gift. And she definitely wants to be famous and successful. 
She needs to be closer to her children. And one of the big challenges in life is oftentimes what we want and what we need are two different things. She has five boys who are all extremely young, as I'm sure you saw, and she has a husband. And while they're all supportive of her going on this journey, somewhere along the line, she lost that connection to what was most important. Now, is she a bad person to make bad decisions? No, good people make bad decisions when they get in lousy states, when our ego gets involved, or when we start believing our story. And here was the story she had. Being a mom's important, but the bigger gift God gave me is my singing voice. And once we get seduced into a particular story, and we start to believe it, it takes a hold of our life and it controls all of our choices. And then pretty soon, bad choice on top of bad choice on top of bad choice starts to affect our life. Can you relate? How many times have you made some choices that you wish like hell you would have made a different decision back then and, and, or that no one ever knows the stupid decisions you've made? I know I can relate to that. So what I want to talk to you about today for this brief little session is how to break through a crisis. Crises happen, whatever type of crises you go through in your life, and I know you've had many, when we make some co choices unconsciously and we get consequences. And we make them unconsciously because we're trying to get what we want. We don't really know what we value most. We don't know what we need. And we find ourselves waking up one day and going, why is my life this way? It's kind of like life is always calling to us to constantly grow and improve. You know, if you're going to look at what's going to make life work, it's really simple. What makes people happy is progress. We're happy when we're progressing. If you're overweight, but you leave today and you say, you know what, this breakthrough thing, what I got out of today for me more than anything else is, I've been stuck waiting for some magical diet, some magical exercise plan, some magical time in the future when I have more time. There is more, no more time. I don't need to wait, wait for that. I'm just going to make a decision today to get started. I don't need to go out there and, and go interview 20 trainers and get online. I don't need somebody to give me a perfect plan. I need just to pick up my shoes and start walking. I need to just get somebody behind me who just goes, run! <laughs> I don't need to wait for perfection. Action. I'm going to do something right now. I choose to get fit. I choose to walk. I choose to run. I choose to go join a club. I'm doing it now. A breakthrough happens the moment you make a new choice. And you don't have to wait. You can just get yourself in a new state. Maybe this tape will get you doing. Or you just have to have a new thought that says, you know what? I made choices in the past. I'm overweight because I chose to eat this and this. I'm not going to eat it anymore. I'm changing now. You can change your whole life real fast with just a few choices. But if you don't make the right choices, eventually you're going to face a crisis. Crisis is when you made so many poor choices that sooner or later life shows up and instead of asking gently for you to change and improve, to grow, to make progress, to be happy, life, when it's a crisis, now demands change. It isn't asking anymore. We borrowed money as a society and we overspent and we talked about changing and we knew we had to change and now a crisis happens and guess what? Nobody has a choice. The game has changed. And what crisis does is it melts us down. It melts us down so that we can recast our life. We can remold ourselves. And usually on the other side, our life is greater because as we go through that crisis, we have to grow. Nobody, everybody wants change. Nobody wants to do it. Everybody, I should say, wants progress, but nobody wants to change. Everybody wants their life better, but nobody wants to do the push-ups, the running, have the economic or emotional discipline to make it happen. But if you're watching this right now and you're still with me, some part of you wants more. And I'm saying to you, choose it. And the way you're going to choose it is really simple. If you're in that crisis, what keeps you in the crisis is probably because you're being reinforced. Most people, they overeat or they smoke or they drink or they yell at people. They keep doing it because they're rewarded. Whatever gets rewarded gets reinforced. Whatever habit or behavior is reinforced becomes a habit and then pretty soon do it long enough, it becomes part of your personality and pretty soon you think it's who you are and you just keep living that way. I mean, it's easy to see this in other people, right? It's easy to see how messed up they are and how easy they could if they just make some new choices. All you got to do is turn on the television, some news program, some entertainment program, and you'll hear detailed descriptions about some person who is a very powerful celebrity who is doing some stupid thing. Why do we see all this stuff on television? Why do we hear about every person you can imagine from Lindsay Lohan to Britney Spears to all the way back to the old days it was Elvis or Michael Jackson or whoever it is that's in the news today in this stage of life in your country as you're watching this? It's because we want to see other people who make bad decisions so we can feel better about our own. But the reason those people don't change, Lindsay Lohan. She's 
got another DUI. She's putting herself at risk. She's putting other people at risk. She could kill someone. She goes to jail. It's supposed to be 90 days. But here's the consequence. It goes to two weeks. And before she even gets out of the jail, she makes a deal for an interview and gets paid a million dollars when she gets out for the interview. What do you think the chances of her changing when her bad behavior gets her a million dollars, and I don't know if she even makes that for that much time of acting at this stage? What do you think the chances are when people around her say it's not your fault, it's not fair, they treat you unfairly? As long as we have the decision that we're not responsible, it's not our fault, we can't change anything. We have no power. So I don't know if by the time you watch this if Lindsay will have changed, but if she did, it'll be because the enablers are gone. She's taken responsibility and she's found something she values more than attention and money for bad behavior. Now it's easy to look at that with her, but what about you and I? Where are you and I addicted to our problems? Where are you and I reinforced? So many people when they have a big problem, listen, if things are going well, you say, oh, it's going so great. Your friends go, well, that's great. And after a while they go, well, easy for you. But if you've got a problem, people go, hey, I understand, and they connect with you. Where do we get addicted to our problems? If you want to make a new choice, if you want to make a new decision today, if you want to have a breakthrough in some area of your life, you've got to give up the story that it's not your fault, and you've got to give up the attention and the love and the connection and the commiserating that comes with it with other human beings. Here's how you change. Five simple, quick steps, and then I'm going to give you a little tool that if you want to, you can go online and really make a change with. If you're going to change your life, step one, I don't care if something has happened to you. You know, somebody has spilled oil all over where you fish. It's horrific. It's disgusting how they've dealt with it, but it's happened and you've got to deal with it. Um, something's happened. Someone in your family has been injured. You've lost your job. I don't care what the problem is. If you're in a crisis, step number one, see it as it is, but don't see it worse than it is. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean be some Mr. or Miss Positive Thinking. By now, if you spend any time with me, you know I'm not about that. I'm not here to tell you, go to that garden and chant, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. Doing affirmations is not going to change your life. You've got to go see where the weeds are and pull them out. My point is simple. You've got to see what the problem is, but you can't make it so horrific that you just give up. Today, this is the first generation in almost 100 years of Americans who now believe, the majority of Americans now believe, that the quality of life for themselves and their kids in the future is going to be worse than the past. They have, in other words, nothing to look forward to. 63% of the U.S. as of today. Wow. When you start thinking there is no future, you go into what we call learned helplessness, a place where you just kind of give up. And if you get to that place of giving up, then, then you have no power over your life. That's when people get depressed. That's when people do crazy, stupid things. That's when people want to turn to drugs or alcohol or sometimes suicide or just total frustration and anger and their life starts to do the opposite of a breakthrough. It becomes completely stuck and in pain or in ongoing suffering. If you and I are going to break out of that, we got to see it as it is. We're not here to be positive thinking people. You've got to see what's really going on. But if you're overweight, you can't say to yourself, well, I'm big boned. That's not why you're overweight. You're overweight because you don't work out, you eat certain things, you eat Cheetos all day long watching TV. I don't know what it is you do, but I know it's not just because you're big boned. You don't want to make it so it's outside your control or you can't change it. So see it as it is, but don't see it worse than it is so that you have no reason to try. Does that make sense? That's the first step. Step two, get to the real truth and deal with it. Don't just see it as it is and not worse than it is. Don't just like balance it, but now get to the truth. I mean, listen, if the truth is you've been trying to get a job for two years and you truly have worked every day in a particular industry and the number of jobs in that industry have shrunk down and you really aren't getting that job, then you may have to look at the truth. The truth is you might have to retool. You might have to say, gosh, you know, the industry I'm in is gone. I mean, gross, simple, simplistic example, but... For years, vinyl records were around for 85 years. It was a gigantic industry. And things came and went. During the vinyl record time, what happened? Well, there was, remember those eight-track tapes? Are you ancient enough to remember those things? Maybe you know somebody remembers those things. These big boxes, you push them in and out. Yeah, eight-tracks came and went. Vinyl records were still here. And then cassette tapes came, right? And cassette tapes were smaller and more compact and more convenient and more seemingly indestructible. And, they came over here and vinyl records were still selling like crazy. If you had a job in vinyl records, you kept it. But then a little thing came along called the CD. And when that happened, 
almost overnight you saw an entire industry that had been around almost a century was gone. If you were the guy that worked in the vinyl record factory and knew everything about it, it was the second generation, didn't matter. It was over. And when, now we laugh about a CD, right? Because everything in this digital world you can have instantly. Who wants to put on a CD? Pretty rare, still available. In vinyl records, maybe there's a small market of people that are collectors, but it's gone. My point is, if you're in the vinyl record business, you've got to tell yourself the truth. You've got to see that it is not worse than it is, but you also got to get the truth and deal with it. You've got to deal with the cards you're dealt. You're going to have to retool. You're going to have to change something. You might have to move. If you live in the Gulf, and I don't support anything that's happened there, who could? It's unconscionable what's happened with BP. But if you live in the Gulf and you're a third generation fisherman and you're now, you fish for oysters and they're dead, you better get to the truth. Are they going to be dead for two years or 10 or 20 to the best of your ability? And you might say, well, I can't do anything else. I can't. I'm a third generation. This is all I know. Yes, you can. Get to the truth and deal with it. Deal with the card you're dealt with. You got to deal with it, sure, I'm sure legally, but in the meantime, you got to take care of your family. I'm not saying this off the cuff easy because I've been in those situations where it's impossible, it's unjust, it's wrong, but I still got to deal with it just like you. Am I making sense? It's like, you might say, I, I've lived here my life, you might have to move, you might have to fish someplace else, you might have to, and I know you still got to deal with all the consequences, but you got to take back control of your life. There are unjust things that happen, but you got to take control. Easy for me to say, I'm not sitting in your shoes, I get that. But who hasn't experienced some form of injustice someplace? Who's not dealt with something unfair? Who's not dealt with something that wasn't meant to be unfair, but it affected your entire life, your career, your finances, whatever? You've got to tell yourself the truth, and you've got to get to those dealing with the reality right now. The longer you wait, the longer the crisis will be. If you're having an economic crisis, got to deal with it. Got to downsize, right size, do whatever it takes. And I say, okay, Tony, well, so far you're telling me don't allow myself to make it so bad I don't try, see it as is, but don't make it worse than it is, and you're telling me get to the truth and deal with it, well, that's nice, but you know, how do I do that? Maybe the third step, more than just getting the, the role model, maybe to be more specific is get a vision first. Get a vision and get strong. That's what I think your third step should be. You first tell yourself the truth, yes, see it as it is, not worse than it is, tell yourself the truth and deal with it, but the way to deal with it is say, what am I gonna go for? There's gotta be a compelling future. I've got to come up with a vision for my life or a vision for my relationship. I've had terrible relationships, nothing's worked. Tell yourself the truth. I've made poor choices or I've told myself stories and gave myself excuses or I've not had the courage, whatever it is, get to the truth and then get yourself a vision for what you do want because you have to have something you're going to move towards. Does that make sense? If, without a vision, people perish. It says in a very good book, called The Good Book, and I know there are many good books, but that's a good one to take a look at. We need something to go for. We can deal with any problem today as long as there's something that we can look for in the future that we can strive for. It'll give us the emotional and psychological fuel, the juice, to keep moving forward. So you've got to come up with a vision, and a way to do that, we'll call that step four. Get a role model. Um, you might get the vision from a role model. You might get the vision just from coming up with a new idea. But in order to figure out how to go from where you are to where you want to be, to close the gap from where you are to where you want to be, it's best to learn by other people's experience whenever you can. So get a role model, get their strategy, and go to work. Get into action. So I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, when I was first starting to try to figure out how to build myself financially, I grew up at a time when just as I was starting to do well, this big recession happened. And I remember I was like 29, 30 years old, I think and maybe 31, and I was doing okay, and then all of a sudden there were all these business challenges because we went through this severe recession back in those days. And I remember at the time everybody was downsizing and freaking out, and I thought, you know what? I don't want to just settle for this. I want to find a way to do well. Who's done well in really tough times? And so I started doing my homework. And in those days, you know, you didn't go out and use the internet the way you do today. You couldn't access all that information. We actually went to libraries and did research in traditional ways. I'm ancient enough to remember those days. And um, I started hearing about this man named Sir John Templeton. Very famous man. He's a man who became a multi-billionaire as an investor. He started with nothing. But what was interesting is when I started to find out about his story, because here's a guy that when he's a young man, he's called Sir John Templeton now. He was actually an American originally. And he wasn't Sir. He came from a very poor family. And he just decided that in his life, 
he wanted to not only do well financially, he wanted to do so well he could help other people at any level that he wanted. And today, by the way, he's passed, but before he did, he created the Templeton Fund, and he also created a fund that now delivers money, gives money each year at the Templeton Prize to people that do good spiritual works, and it's larger than the Nobel Prize, and it continues to go on. But the guy started with nothing, and here's how he did it. Listen to me now. The reason I look for him as a role model is because he made all his money in the worst of times. He made all his money when people were going through the equivalent of the deepest recession or depression possible. His whole belief was, and this is different than almost anybody else you see around you, was pessimism was the secret to success. <laughs> that what he wanted to do was make money when people were most pessimistic. Because when people are optimistic, they want you to pay for their house a huge sum of money. But as they start getting more and more pessimistic, where pretty soon they think they can never, the house is the worst thing to have, they'll virtually give you the house. They'll virtually give you the business. And so he made all his money starting in World War II. When the war broke out, when Hitler invaded over in Europe, he took all the money he had and borrowed a total of money of $10,000, a total amount. He bought with $10,000 every stock on the New York Stock Exchange that was $1 or less that he thought might be useful, including some companies that look like they're going to be bankrupt. But he did it when people were the most pessimistic. Because if you recall, it looked like Hitler was going to take over. It didn't look like we were all going to be the winners. It looked like Hitler was going to dominate. And when people were that scared, they would give up anything they had just to get a little bit back. And so he bought all the stock that eventually made him a multi-billionaire. He became a billionaire because after things changed, after the war, just five years later, and the economy started to surge, everything changed for him. Where do you think he invested next after World War II? Where was a country that was pummeled, that was down, the factories were basically turned into mud? Japan. You could buy things for pennies in Japan that would have cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars before, and he did. When everyone was most pessimistic, he went and did well. And then he sold when the 80s surged and when everybody thought Japan was the greatest country on earth and had the biggest businesses he sold and made his maximum profit when people were overly optimistic. He did the same thing down in South America when inflation went crazy. This man spent his entire life basically having a strategy of how to succeed when everybody else was scared. I tell you that because he's a role model. What he did, how he did it, it's all in writing, it's crystal clear. You could do the same, but you won't be able to do it when you're telling yourself the sky is falling and it's over. When you see it worse than it is, you'll just give up. You won't do it if you don't tell yourself the truth is, you know what, this system isn't working. I got to do something. I got to change my finances. I got to change my job. I got to reach. If you don't tell yourself the truth and deal with the truth, the real truth, nothing's going to happen. You won't ever even think about a guy like John Templeton if you don't have a vision that says, I don't care how the environment is. I'm going to find a way to do well. And you won't do well unless you get a strategy based on a role model who's really done it. My whole thing is this. If anybody has something you want, they aren't lucky. They did something. If you model them, if you take similar steps, you can produce a similar result. Make sense? And then finally, the fifth step, look, if you're in a situation where you see it as is but not worse than it is, if you've told yourself the truth and you dealt the cards you're dealt with and just decided you're going to change it and you're willing to do what's necessary, if you put yourself in a place where you got a new vision and you've gotten yourself strong, if you got a role model and you've got some strategy and you've got yourself into action, step five is give much more than you expect to receive. Simple as that sounds, if you find a way to meet people's needs in business, in an intimate relationship, meeting your kids' needs, anybody's needs, the whole game changes. What happened here when all of a sudden, you know, Melissa finds herself coming home and all of a sudden she finds out that while she's gone, her kids now don't want to talk to her, her boys, her husband has had an affair. Well, none of that could change if she would have just said, you know what, my whole life is over, I'm done. And oh, by the way, I've just lost my career too because while I'm busy trying to deal with my family, I didn't finish the record, so I lose my record deal. And oh, by the way, we don't have any financial stability, now we're losing our house. If that family would have just said it's over, if Melissa or Rick either just said it's over, it would have been over, but they told themselves the truth. We got severe problems here, but they didn't make it worse than it was. They didn't say we can't turn it around. And then they got to the truth, the truth of the infidelity, the truth of her addiction to going after fame instead of being a mom, the truth that neither one of them had been really competent at parents and had not given the energy to the kids that they deserved. The truth, is, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off.
<laughs> you know, the truth will, it doesn't feel good, but not feeling good is sometimes is where you get your drive to change things. They, they started looking around and said, we don't have the skill to even manage our house, much less our finances. We got to do something different. We got to focus on our kids. We got to focus on turning things around. We got to turn our relationship around. But that wouldn't have worked unless they got a vision of starting to see, you know, it could happen. And that's what I helped them with. I helped them get to the truth. I helped them to stop over exaggerating. I got them to a place where they got to see that this relationship could be back alive and passionate and that these kids deserve both their parents and that she really could be a great mom and that maybe in the end she could even still have her singing career and enjoy it too. That she didn't have to give it all up. And I'm really proud of her. She did it because she found a role model. She got a vision, but she got a full role model. And the man that she works with today is a man that sold, I think now, 5 million or 10 million records. And most people outside the country business don't know his name. He's her mentor now. He's made music with, you know, Willie Nelson, with just about anybody you can imagine in the business. And he's done it for all these years, but he's never left the central part of Texas because that's where his family is. And Melissa's had offers to go to Sony, Sony Red. She walked away because they said, you're going to have to do these things without your family. She found out what was most important, and she made the decisions that made, met her needs to be a great mom. When you fight life and go, I should be a singer and not a mom, and you got five kids, you got a problem. When you fight life and say, you know, the economy should be different, you're going to be stressed. Deal with what is, without exaggeration, with total honesty, dealing with the cards, coming up with a vision, finding yourself a role model that shows your strategy, work your tail off, give, 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 keep changing your approach, and you can get where you want to go.